Uh, good morning. I'm Terry Fox. This training is Signal Integrity and Electromagnetic Compliance uh, training, and I say for mere mortals uh, because this is aimed at people that actually have to get jobs done and are not uh, Signal Integrity uh, experts or gurus. So anyway, my goal is to teach everyone in the universe how to design high-speed digital analog RF systems that work right and pass FCC CISPR tests on the first try. Now when I say on the first try that was not a slip of the tongue uh, this is what I do in my consulting work and have done for a long time at this point. So off we go. If you want to get more information you can go to SIEMC.com but here we go. First of all we're going to go through signal integrity and electromagnetic compliance basics. So I'll have a video on each of these subjects. The one in red is the one that we're discussing at the moment. So when you are going to look at transmission line behavior, there are two pieces to it. There is the signal current. This would be like address zero or clock or uh, data one or something like that. And the second part of it is the return current and that is the current that goes from the load back to the source. So the signal current goes from the source to the load. The return current goes back from the load to the source. So uh, we, we don't have a big bucket where we stack up uh, you know electron coulombs someplace. These things have got to go in a complete loop. Now when we talk about this a place where the return current flows. If we're talking about standard uh, printed circuit boards, that that is a plane. We normally will have a four mil trace, uh, four mils over the ground plane uh, running from source to load and then that will be reference to what we call a reference plane and the reference plane is either connected to power or ground of the driver here. Now, this is the way it works. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining why that's the way it works. I'm just trying to get through uh, what are the basics for, for getting the job done, getting it done right, and away we go. So if this is a side view of, of say, layer one and then layer two, which would be a plane, now let's look at that end on. If I look at it end on, here's my four mil wide trace, four mils over the ground plane, and the current that is the signal current is flowing and it is constrained by the dimensions of that trace. This is something that we have on our schematic and this is something that the layout person actually routes. Now if I look at the return current, it looks kind of like a pile of sand you know it's not constrained by the edges it looks like a pile of sand but if I was to look at it top down that return current flows right underneath the signal current so if the signal current started here and it went over down over up over down etc the return current will flow right underneath the return current just like this. So the return current flows under the signal current. Now again this is assuming that I have an unbroken plane that the plane is connected to either power or ground of that driver and that is simply the way it works. Now the problem is that everybody's going to say oh well that isn't always the way that works. Well I'm sorry this really is the way it works but you've got to have a quick and easy way to explain why this is the way it works. So the quick and easy uh, explanation for that is that the return current wants to follow the signal current because of the right hand rule. Now you're not in physically one of my classes where you can see me hold up my right hand but imagine that the current was going the direction of your thumb and your fingers would wrap around forward and that would form for example uh, you know if I've got a current flowing it will create a magnetic field so as the fingers roll around say on the signal current that would look like uh, say a north pole on a magnet now if on the other hand you flip your hand over and so the return current is going the direction of your thumb and then you look at your fingers coming around that would look like the magnetic field that would be the south pole 
Now think about when you were a kid and you played with magnets. You would take a north pole and a south pole and they would attract. If you took a north to a north, it would repel. A south to a south, it would repel. But a north to a south, it would attract. So consequently, this is exactly how that stuff works, assuming that you've got an unbroken uh, reference plane uh, where this signal is routed over. Now, let's understand a few things about what interferes with a reference or what interferes uh, with a signal and what doesn't. If I've got a given width and a given height above the ground plane and a given dielectric constant, then this trace is going to be a fixed impedance trace. It'll be a controlled impedance trace. Now, if on the other hand, I go through and, uh, well, let's try it this way. If I was to put a cut into the ground plane right here, and this copper was not there, so there's no copper in this location, have I affected the return current at all? No, I haven't, because the return current is flowing right underneath the signal current, and all I've done is I've removed copper on what in this case would either be the, the power or the ground plane underneath it. So I haven't interfered with the signal current and I also have not interfered with the return current. So cutting out copper in this area would not affect this particular signal at all. Now let's try a second case here. What happens if someone on layer 2, so we're talking about on the reference plane, cut in here like this? Now, at that point, the return current could not flow through here because there would be no copper in this area. Now, the signal current is on layer 1, so it'll still flow across, but the return current could not flow through here. And so what's going to have to happen? Well, the return current is going to have to go around this break in the plane. So does that affect the impedance of this uh, uh, transmission line? Absolutely. And a number of things happen when this happens. One is that we get this impedance discontinuity. That will cause a reflection. Another thing that happens is that uh, and, and this is some place where you'll get into lots of problems with radiated emissions and it doesn't seem intuitively obvious why that happened. If I take the signal coming out of this uh, area, let's see, I think we're running out of time for YouTube, uh, but to make it quick, if these signals came out here, they're in phase, there they're in phase, there they're in phase, there they're in phase, but at this point since this had to follow a longer distance, now these things are out of phase. As long as they're in phase, their magnetic fields for the most part cancel. When they are out of phase, the magnetic fields do not cancel as well, and right there is where you start coming up with problems uh, that you see on the spectrum analyzer uh, for radiated emissions. So, Anyway, I think I'm out of time for what I can put on one YouTube uh, video, and uh, let's uh, do whatever is next here. Oh, I forgot about this stuff. Controlled impedance layer routing pair. Now, where is the return current? Uh, and how does it change reference planes? So I want to go to this. Uh, there we go. So if I take a look at this, and I want to understand where does this return current flow, let's look at it in terms of going through a via. If I go from layer 1 to, say, layer 3, and if layer 2 is a ground plane, then is there any way to lose the return current when the signal goes through the via? Well, no, there isn't, because the return current stays on exactly the same plane. There's nothing to interrupt that. So whether I go from layer 1 to layer 3 or layer 3 to layer 1, etc., 
I am not losing the return current. So going either side of a single plane, as long as the plane is the driver, uh, the, as long as the plane, the driver is the power ground, then this is a very, very safe way to uh, route uh, signals and handle crossovers. Um, and we can do this up to quite high frequencies. Now, let's take, for example, an eight layer board where I go signal, ground, signal, uh, maybe a power ground sandwich in the middle, then signal, ground, signal. And at this point, I go from the top layer, I go to the bottom layer. Now, on the top layer, the signal uh, return current happens to be on layer two. If I go down to the bottom layer here, the return current is going to be on layer seven. Now, that's a ground, this is a ground, but the question is, how did the return current get from the ground plane on layer two to the ground plane on layer seven? And the answer is, when you switch those reference planes of the same voltage, if you add stitching vias tying that plane to this plane, then you give a path for the return current to flow. And the real question is, uh, how many of those stitch, stitch, stitching vias do you need? And where are you going to place them? And uh, is that going to be adequate for your design? And we'll have uh, something on that later. Now on the other hand, let's take a six layer board. So here I've got signal, ground, signal, signal, power, and signal. And if I go from layer one, which is reference to ground, to layer six, which is reference to power, how does the return current get from a ground plane to a power plane? Well, that has to be done through capacitors. The problem with this is that is a difficult thing to analyze because it depends upon what capacitors you're using, where are they located, how are they mounted, what are their values, what is their physical size. Uh, and so if you do not have something like a power integrity tool, uh, this is a bit of a dangerous uh, path. And the higher you go in frequency, uh, the more dangerous it is. Now, finally, we've got those people that insist on routing high-speed signals across a break in the reference plane. Well, if you do that, that is just bad, 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 bad. Don't do that. That's dumb as a rock. Do not do this. I don't care whose book or whose class you go to. We never want to run across a break in the reference plane. Now, there's one very interesting little uh, exception to that rule, uh, but f uh, for most of you, I don't want to go into that. Uh, let's just leave it at this. So, signal integrity and electromagnetic compli compliance, it's training for mere mortals. Uh, we've got more information on SIEMC.com. Again, my goal is to teach everyone in the universe how to design high-speed digital analog RF systems that work right and pass FCC tests on the first try.